Welcome back, sir. Now, the local governments are not allowed to issue bonds because of the uh, budget deficits. Now, how can we have enough money to have a second round of uh, stimulus to sustain the Chinese economic growth? I can, there are several ways. Currently, you know, if a local government wants to issue bonds, they ask NDRC, National Community uh, Development, of Reform and Development, to issue the bond on their behalf. And certainly, they can continue to do that. Currently, because we have a balanced budget regulations, so the local government, they cannot issue local bond uh, you know, by themselves. But if there are necessity, we can certainly reform the regulations. But uh, to make local government responsible for their deficit, we also need to enhance the local people's congress, their role on the supervision of the government. So certainly, I think that China is a developing country. We need to continue to improve our institution and our policies. So that is one direction. You know, there are some discussion. And uh, when the opportunity matures, that will be a direction that we can move. The other negative factor that may have prevented the Chinese economy from uh, moving on uh, more rapidly as we did has been the rise of labor costs and perhaps uh, the entry into the WTO, the rise of uh, uh, corporate income tax, uh, so on and so forth. So the national treatment may uh, uh, have di discouraged some of the multinational players uh, from uh, uh, sustaining their uh, uh, presence in the Chinese market. Do you think this uh, negative trend is likely to continue um, following the uh, recent uh, protests against the Japanese? Uh, now, some of the Japanese giants are reconsidering their investment and production in the Chinese market. Um, do you think uh, we have exhausted our dividends, we have exhausted our options, uh, and therefore we are facing the lowest turning point and the middle income trap, as in the case of many other developing countries? Uh, first, I don't think that is a negative trend, because the goal for economic development is to raise people's different standards. I think that uh, that's a necessary and uh, also it's a consequence of economic development. Because the goal of economic development is to raise the different standards of every citizen in China. And unless their wages can increase along, the, along China's economic development, Otherwise, how can you raise their different standards? So I think it's a positive thing. But the increase in the wage rate certainly will put a cost pressure on the enterprises. And a response from the enterprises or the business community is to upgrade their industries, to have a technological innovation in order to you know, absorb this kind of cost pressure, at the same time to further improve their competitiveness. And you talk about middle income trap. The way to over middle income trap is not to reduce wage. The way to over in middle income trap is to have a process of continuous in the technological innovation and the industrial upgrading. And so, you know, our value added in our economic production can be increased continuously. And with that, people's income can increase continuously. And then we can reach the status as a high-income country. So I think that's a necessary process. It's a positive thing, but everything has two sides. The business community need to cope with this opportunity and to face these challenges. Upon your return from the World Bank, uh, uh, you made some uh, very uh, impressive remarks about the future of the Chinese economy. For example, you uh, predicted that uh, our economy will be able to uh, develop at an annual rate of 8% uh, uh, 
or has the potential to develop uh, at an annual GDP growth rate of 8% for the next 20 years. You wowed the whole world with this sensational prediction. W what is the basis for your judgment? Uh, well, I'd like to say first, this is not the first time for me to make that prediction. You know, I published my book, Demystifying the Chinese Economy, and the Chinese version was published in 2009 and that prediction was in the book already. I published the China Medical in 1994. That prediction was in the China Medical in the 1994 already. And the reason why I had the confidence to make that prediction about the Chinese economies has the potential to maintain another year's 8% uh, growth rate on the basis of 32 years of 9.9% .9 growth rate. Mm -hmm. It was exactly in, a, in response to your question about the middle income trap. The way for a country to have a continuous income growth is on the basis of continuous technological innovation and industrial upgrading. And uh, this is the drivers of economic growth. It's the same for the high-income country and uh, for the middle-income country or for the low-income countries. But for the developing countries, in the process of their technological innovation and uh, industrial upgrading, they have something called the advantage of backwardness. Because technological innovation in that upgrading, they can benefit from the existing technology and in industries in high income country. And historical evidence and economic analysis show if a country know, knows how to use that advantage of backwardness, they can reach 8%, 9%, or 10% growth rate. I mentioned China has grown dynamically for 32 years. But even with that, China is still a middle income country. And the latest data I have for China to make a comparison is 2008. In 2008, the per capita income in China measured by purchasing power parity was 21%. Mm -hmm of the U.S. in that year. It was the same at Japan in 1951, Singapore in 1967, and uh, Taiwan in 1975, and uh, Korea in 1977. And these East Asian economies, by tapping into the potential advantage of backwardness in uh, economic development. Japan maintained 20 years of average 9.2% annual growth rate. And due to one decade recession following the uh, uh, Plaza Accord. And that's from, no, that's from 1951 to 1971. Plaza Accord was in 1985, okay. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and Singapore was, you know, grew at 8.6% continuously for 20 years, from 67 to 87. And uh, Taiwan, 20 years of average 8.3% growth rate from 75 to 95. And, uh, Singapore, uh, from and Korea, you know, 20 years of average 7.6 percent from 77 to 97. I mentioned the East Asian economies. Their development pattern was exactly the same as the development pattern that China followed after the reform in 79. If they could grow at 7.6% to 9.2%. Realize that for 20 years. That means China has the potential to
to grow at around 8% for another 20 years. But certainly it's a potential. We need to do a lot of effort to reform the economies and to develop the economy along the line of China's competitive advantages in order to tap into the potential. And that is the, you know, my analysis. And as you say, because most people now, they are influenced by the short run, you know, down, slow down, and they forgot to look into that potential. History tells the future. That's the Chinese way of thinking. Now, uh, when we look at how to sustain the economic growth in China, uh, I remember many scholars in the West say China will get old before it gets rich. Um, what do you think of, very briefly, Professor Lin, what do you think of the one-child policy, the family planning policy that may turn out to be a curse instead of a plus for the uh, uh, sustainability of the economic growth? Now, people started to talk about relaxing the one-child policy. Yeah. I think that certainly because, you know, the democratic, demographic trend is clear. China, sooner or later, will reach the aging society. And because of one-child policies, that will come earlier than other countries. But I think that may, you know, put a little bit pressure, but there's a lot of policy responses that will help China to cope with that. The first one is, you know, that China currently has a very early retirement age. For the male, 55, for the female, 50. So we can extend a little bit of the retirement age, and that will increase the labor supply. But more importantly than that is the substitution between quantity and quality. You know, and what is really important is not so much of the quantity of labor force. More important is the quality of the labor force. It's a matter of productivity. Yeah, and in anticipation that the supply of the labor force, its growth rate may slow down. And China can put more emphasis on education, on enhancing the quality of the labor force by education, by training, and I think that will overcome the reduction in the quantities of the labor force. And the last one, as you mentioned, certainly the government can consider in, uh, the possibility of relaxation in the one-child policies. But in effect, in the countryside, the policy has been relaxed. And in urban areas, there are also some relaxation. You know, I don't know how many children you have or how many brothers and sisters you have. We know that for our families, if both spouse, that's husband and uh, wife, if they both come from a one-child family, then they can have a second birth, right? So that's a relaxation. So certainly, you know, that may cause a little bit of pressure, but I'm sure there are enough scopes for policy responses to mitigate the negative side of that pressure. Thank you very much. We don't have enough time to discuss uh future of the small and medium sized enterprises and what the uh, reform of the financial system in China means for their uh, ability to uh, get loans. But uh, thank you very much for your participation. I do appreciate it. Thanks a lot.